Hello and welcome to Pod Rocket. Today I'm here with Leon Cooperman, who's the founder and CTO of Cast AI. How are you, Leon? Hey Ben, how are you? Good to be with you. Yeah, excited to have you and excited to learn about Cast. Um, so why don't you give us a quick overview of uh, what you're building? Sure. So like I've been doing this kind of startup thing for most of my life. Very rarely am I in large companies. Uh, like the last large company I was in was because our startup was acquired by Oracle and I had to spend, do my stint at Oracle, which was actually much more interesting than, uh, m much more fun and interesting than I thought it was going to be. I was pleasantly surprised. But one of the things that we noticed, um, and in startup life, you tend to solve problems that you have, right? Like if, if you've never faced problems in the industry, it's hard to come up with an interesting idea. Um, and we had this massive problem because uh, the, the startup was called Zen Edge and we had this massive problem with cost control. So we were growing the company, growing the product, the pro customers loved it, everything was great, but because we were fully hosted in the cloud, it, we were in like 30 regions of AWS or however many regions they had, every large customer we'd on board, the, the bill would spike. And then I'd have this massive disagreement and argument with my CEO about why the why the bill's growing. And I, and I honestly, I had no answer. So while we were pretty successful on the product side and the customer side, the investor side and the acquisition, we failed miserably on cost management. And then I saw this pattern a bunch of times in the industry. And then I, I can't be the only guy that can't figure out my bill, like even though it is a complicated one. Um, and then we had this vision to say, all right, what would it take to solve this problem for all customers? And so we came up with this platform based on three basic principles. And I'll talk clearly what they are. Like the first one is the world is moving to containers. Like for, the, for those in the audience who are unfamiliar, containers are like the smallest kind of unit of computing uh, that fit into kind of cloud compute. The second principle is, well, if, if the world is moving to containers over the next five to seven years, they need an orchestration platform. So it was pretty clear that Kubernetes was the orchestration platform winner for container management. And then the third principle, which is kind of maybe the most controversial is if those first two things are true, we do not have enough engineers in the world to manage all of these complexities of cloud infrastructure and containerized management. We need containers to be autonomous. We need them to run automatically in Kubernetes. And that's the vision for CAST. We want to make Kubernetes an autonomous platform and we're starting with cost control as the first pillar of functionality that we're helping customers with. And that's what the platform does today. In a nutshell, customers that come to us that already run Kubernetes clusters, sign up, they go through a small process and they're able to see that they can save somewhere between 30 and 80% of their bill almost immediately. And then they can onboard themselves or we help them with it and they start saving right away. A bunch to dig in on there. I mean, I really like that idea of the kind of three core principles and, and building the company and the product based on, you know, if you believe in these principles, then it's very clear that there's a need for a product like this. Um, the first thing I'm curious about, as you said, like, typically, when someone starts using casts, you can find 30 to 80% savings right away. Like, what are some of the, the typical low hanging fruit you find it in customers' applications that are just like can very quickly be fixed. Yeah, there's like a bunch of these wells of waste, I call them. So the first one is uh, human bias in the types of infrastructure that you choose. Like you as a DevOps engineer are used to, I'll just use an AWS, uh, M5 extra large instances, you've used them for the last three years, you're happy with their performance, you're not gonna use anything else. Well, that's that's a bias that a computer won't have we're going to choose the best infrastructure for the job at the best possible price. So, so that's kind of like infrastructure choices, one bucket. The next one is Kubernetes does a really bad job. It's a very fair platform, which means if you've got 10 computers in your cluster, your workloads are going to get spread across 10 computers. Well, you might not need 10 computers, right? So it does this even spray. And so bin packing is a really big problem for customers. They don't pack their workloads insufficiently and they leave a lot of waste on every single server. And then the third one is the sandbagging problem. So if you've got like an engineering team 
that sets up some resource requirements for the workloads for the applications. And then you have a DevOps team that maybe sandbags that by 20%. And then maybe you have an SRE team. Like no one wants to get woken up in the middle of the night. Like that's, so everyone sandbags and then you end up with three extra capacity. So you're asking for 16 CPUs for an application that needs three CPUs or something along those lines. So those are kind of the main pools. And then I would say there's one interesting pool, which is the wrong type of instance life cycles. And I'll explain what I mean. Amazon and all clouds sell their computers kind of in three modes. The traditional on-demand mode, which is pay as you go, like it's a dollar an hour, you know, as soon as you don't need it, shut it down. Cool. That was the original pro promise of cloud. And then customers came back to those cloud providers and said, well, this is all way too expensive. How do we go cheaper? And they said, no problem. Commit to us for two years, three years, pay some money down and we will drop your price. Like we'll give you a, a continuous use discount it's called or a savings plan discount. Well, that's all fine and dandy, but then it takes away from the original promise of cloud. Now I'm back into three-year contracts. And what if I want to change something in my business? Well, I'm stuck with this bill, right? So we don't like, those are a necessary evil. We don't like them. And then the third type of life cycle is this thing called a preemptible or a spot instance. And those are the most interesting for us because they're currently underused in the market. These are computers that no one's using. They're excess inventory. And we can go grab them for a fraction of the price, 80% off. Super powerful computers that just aren't being used. Well, the problem with those and why only 7% of customers use those type of computers because they have a very, they have no SLA. They have no guarantee from the cloud provider, meaning AWS can take that computer away from you in two minutes notice. GCP can do the same thing with 30 seconds notice. So customers don't like the chaos and unless it's fully automated, they don't want to deal with it. So we provide that automation layer that lets us go and buy the cheapest possible lifecycle instances from the market. And we do that on a continuous basis. So what does it look like to get started with CAST? Um, you know, I, I have, let's say I have a cloud application and I guess maybe first question, does it have to be using Kubernetes or are you a bit more agnostic than that in terms of how the application is architected? No, we are not agnostic. So if you're using Kubernetes, we're the right people for you. If Got you're it. not using Kubernetes, then we're the wrong people for you. And it's a very black and white thing. Like we're going to spend the next five, seven, however many years this journey is just making this one particular platform as automated as possible. Why only focus there, Ben? Because I believe that everyone's going to be there anyway. We're just going to meet customers where they're going to end up in five years. Got it. So I have my Kubernetes application. What is it? What's the process look like to get started with CAST? Yeah, well, the first piece is free. Like you just go to the website, you sign up, you run this uh, small agent. It's a read-only agent that installs into your cluster. And then within five minutes, you get this big report back that says, all right, here's where all your waste is. Here's what we would do differently. Here's your cost allocation. We have this beautiful visualization across all your teams. So Kubernetes is a really good multi-tenant system, meaning you can have multiple service teams in the same cluster sharing infrastructure. So we say, here's all of the cost structure between all of your, your components and teams and how it all breaks down to the lowest level. And then... You don't have to do anything. Like you can just take that report and implement it if you want. Or you can say, yeah, I want to try this automation. And you move to what's our kind of our phase two of our platform, which is you onboard our read write permissions, right? So we create a, a set of permissions to actively manage your Kubernetes cluster. And then that's it, basically. That's all you really need to do to get started. And there's kind of two modes of optimization, a slow a slow roll optimization or an immediate optimization that gets you all the savings over a 10 minute period. And it's your choice of which path to take. Got it. And so you, you make these recommendations into what I can do. And then it, it sounds like you automate the implementation of those recommendations. Is that accurate? And can you do those automations regardless of whether I'm on Amazon or Google or wherever my application is hosted, you can implement these different uh, optimizations and automations. Yeah, and that's probably the difference between us and most 99% of cost optim. Most other folks give you a report and, you know, see, Bob's your uncle, see you later. And then nobody implements those things because who wants to take the risk of taking a recommendation and then having downtime? Whereas we take this very micro-optimization approach, we start optimizing and take step-by-step step until it's all done. Uh, and yeah, we can work with any of the three major hyperscalers. So Amazon, Google, Azure, 
Uh, they all have Kubernetes offerings that we plug right into. Um, and then we'll have more in the future as other clouds grow in, in size and scope. So yeah, you don't have to do much. You, you just turn it on. We take the place of what's called the cluster autoscaler in, in Kubernetes terms. So you turn that off and we replace that thing and we're, we're, we're off to the optimization races. Why, why do you, I'm curious, like you replace the cluster autoscaler. So that's like, correct me if I'm wrong, but that's Kubernetes kind of native autoscaling system that implements the logic of autoscaling. Why do you think, um, why do you think the Kubernetes team hasn't like built in more intelligent optimization since it seems like something every Kubernetes user would want over time? Yeah. So, I mean, the cluster autoscaler is great. It just doesn't treat cost as a first principle to scaling. And part of it is it doesn't know what the costs are. It's pretty dumb engine. It knows about computers and node pools. So there are two things. Like uh, Kubernetes is this concept of homogeneous pools, right? So pools of machines that get added to a cluster, that's an anti-pattern from my perspective. There's no reason to do that. There's no reason why you can't mix and match. It's like playing a game of Tetris, right? Like you can take the blocks that you need to fill the puzzle at that moment. There's no reason to take you know, eight long bars all of the time when those will create a lot of fragmentation in your puzzle. So I, I think that the original premise for the autoscaler is flawed in that it's, heter it's, it's homogeneous. Now, there are other open source projects that try to solve that problem, one called Carpenter that AWS is, is promoting that tries to move in our direction of these heterogeneous mixed instance clusters. And that's cool. Um, and, and then the second piece is, is that the cluster autoscaler does not have the capacity or the capability to do the analysis of what where the market trend is going, right? And a big part of this and why it's a SaaS platform is that we're ingesting all of this cloud data from all regions of all clouds. And we're doing forward looking analysis to see where the market is going to see if you're likely to get interrupted. There's all these calculations that are, it's just not something that you wanna do locally inside of your cluster. Um, we use a lot of compute to do that. Got it. So you're saying you look across all your customers who are using CAST and can kind of be smarter than any one individual tool could be because it doesn't have that data across the different cloud providers and different applications. Is that accurate? Yeah, that's one of them. So like, and every, and I'll, I'll give you a little bit of our secret sauce here, Ben. The reason why we give everyone a free agent that, that they can look at all of our recommendations is it's a it's a value for value trade. Like we're giving you a valuable recommendation that you can use anytime. We're also taking your data and we're making it part of our machine learning analysis platform. I'm curious, like any, Maybe this goes back to some of the things you mentioned at the beginning of the call, like the common sources of waste in an average Kubernetes application. But like, I'm curious beyond those, like any particularly interesting learnings that you've seen from doing data analysis across the pool of your all of your customers? Yeah, there, there's some really interesting, there are some really interesting phenomenon happening. And, I, and I'm actually in the middle of writing a pretty uh, cool white paper about it around so you're familiar with like Moore's law, like the fact that computing power tends to double eight, every 18 months. And if you if you back up, it would imply the costs of compute tend to have every like, you know, if you're not if you if, if you're producing in the same way for double the computing capacity, your costs should go down. Right. So all of that's true. And I think that Moore's law is about to based on what we're seeing that's happening in the market we see there's an inflection point where the Moore's law, it's more like an observation, is about to break because of geopolitical uh, issues. Like, so we have this massive supply chain disruption where you know automotive chips are just not available, but that's not only automotive, it's like it's bleeding to everywhere, right? So we're seeing cloud inflation for the first time since the introduction of cloud. And it happens in subtle ways differently depending on the provider. So for example, Google just increased their prices on traffic uh, going in and out of certain regions, full stop. They just like tripled it. I think it has tripled it in some cases, right? Amazon does it slightly differently, right? Where the those spot instances I was talking about, they're becoming more scarce. So the ability to replace them quickly with other types while the market is dry is super important. Um, so so the we learned a lot going through this holiday season 
from about November to January when the market was particularly dry and we saw prices edging up. And then sometimes there would be a complete drought at very critical times. And one of the things that I'm super cautious about and passionate about making sure our customers have solutions for is what happens in those times of drought when they absolutely need computers, but those computers just happen to be more expensive temporarily. I'm curious, you know, you you touched on a bit kind of some of the gaps in your competition. Um, I'm familiar with a few of the cloud optimization platforms. Like I, one of my colleagues used to work at Cloud Health. Um, I know there's like Cloud Scaler, and there's a, there's a whole bunch of these tools that um, currently or in the past sought to to help people manage their their growing cloud bills. I, I think I know the answer, but I'm curious to hear from you, like what's the pitch for how cast is different and are there any ways where those tools are actually a better fit? Um, I guess I can guess one is if you're not using Kubernetes, then cast isn't for you. We've talked about that, but be, if you are a Kubernetes app, like what are some of the particular ways where cast um, is superior or different from competition? Yeah. So that's a great question. If you're not using Kubernetes, like cloud health, and team like and all of those guys and most of them have been acquired like you know over the last several years so they're all kind of legacy platforms at this point but they still do a great job they do a great job if you need to reduce your rds spend or your ec2 spend like they they find they have good rules and heuristics for places where they've commonly seen customers waste money and, and that's cool if you are using kubernetes you have a really interesting problem in that you've seen you have multiple teams using the same infrastructure. So at the container level, let's say you get a bill for $1,000 for this set of computers. Which team are you going to hold accountable for that $1,000 bill? And like none of those tools have really good container insights. Just even the insights, never mind the, the self-optimization piece, right? So one place where we help our customers significantly is understanding and holding individual services accountable for their spend. And this is where engineers get to learn about cloud economics and understand the best practices of scaling their services in a cost-effective way. And then the second place is, the second piece is obviously, I think what you alluded to is we're, we're, we're moving from the perspective of you can't spend human time, you just need to have computers make these micro decisions. And we do that every 15 seconds. It's very hard for a human being to keep up with those types of optimizations. So w one of the things we were talking about a bit before we started, uh, before we started recording was the, the one of the problems that developers and teams building applications face nowadays is vendor lock-in and people start building on Google or Amazon or Azure and um, you get locked in over time. And th that can be from a variety of reasons, and I know you have strong feelings about this. So, curious to hear, um, you know, your your thoughts on kind of how why that is a problem, and maybe some of the ways that Cast can be helpful long term in fixing that. Absolutely, Ben. Now you're going to get me started on this rant, uh, but but let me try to let me try to uh, like summarize it. So, uh, clouds obviously want you to stay in their ecosystem like it's a, a natural kind of monopolistic tendency like monopolies are worth more than you know completely open free market enterprises so there's a couple of things that they they do that trap customers and so some of them are like if you use proprietary protocols like i'll give you an example if you choose to use dynamodb in aws right which is one of their database offerings versus like RDS, which can have a Postgres flavor or, an I, or a MySQL flavor that's av available anywhere. If you're using DynamoDB, you're pretty much sticking with Amazon from the, here on out until the end, right? Like you're, you have locked yourself in. The other really interesting, so like I encourage my customers to use open source wherever possible. Like there's, there's no single service that these clouds have that is so irreplaceable that it can't be replaced with a more flexible and uh, transferable uh, service offering. But the one really egregious kind of practice that I see that all three of the major uh, hyperscales perform is the charging of data. Let me, let, me, let me explain what I mean. When you have traffic uh, going into AWS, Google, or Azure, you don't pay anything for that. That's called ingress. And you get that for $0 per gigabyte. When you try to take your data out, it's like Hotel California. 
you can check out anytime you want, but you ain't going anywhere because that number is so high that it's cost prohibitive to actually move your data and make it transferable. So it's nine cents a gigabyte. That's roughly the starting list price for transfer out or what's called egress. And you might, and then you might say, hey, Leon, that sounds like not a lot. Like I pay a lot more than that for like cell data or whatever. Yeah, except when you do the math, it's 30x the cost of the transfer. So like you are paying the equivalent of 30 something dollars per megabit and Amazon is paying 75 cents or Google is paying 75 cents. Um, that is egregious and it has to be fixed because until that gets fixed and it might get, need to get fixed from, I don't know, from a legislative perspective, like someone needs to step in to kind of break this monopolistic behavior because it is only hurting the customer. You are charging money for something that it doesn't cost you anywhere close to that number, and you're doing it specifically to prevent for customers from moving data around. And I, I guess to be fair, like you know, developers are smart people and understand these dynamics before choosing a cloud provider. Um, but I guess is, is your contention that it's kind of like a oligopoly between the cloud providers and they're colluding to raise all of them raise their their uh, egress fees such that you get whichever one you choose you get locked in and that's why it would make sense for the government to to get involved it is an oligopolistic behavior and until you have a player that comes in that's willing to drop that price to win business and there's an example of that but they're not making a huge like oracle is a good example of that like my former employer like why did they win so much Zoom business back when the pandemic started? Well, Zoom needed to expand like crazy. Um, they didn't, there was no computers, but the egress fees were also killing Zoom because remember what Zoom is in the business of feeding video, right? So uh, Oracle was able to come in with a super aggressive egress price and they were able to win a bunch of business. But it, it, there, there isn't enough of that competition to drive prices down naturally. So we either need a super big player to come in doesn't look like there's one on the horizon, or we need some intervention to say, look, guys, there needs to be some equality of costs on the traffic side. Right. But I guess that's a good point that there's there's multiple reasons why egress is important. There are some use cases where part of the core use case is to have users download data or stream video or things like that. And then there's the reason why you want egress to just be able to switch clouds. Um, so I guess the, the form... There are market forces that that opt that uh, push providers to be aggressive for the former, like Oracle, but not a lot of market forces that would make any of these players want to allow data to be easily sent from their platforms to another cloud provider. Oracle and Microsoft did another interesting thing where they kind of partnered together to wire their data centers over what's called the layer two connection. And the reason for that was they had enterprise customers that said, oh, we want an Oracle database. We want a .NET application. So how do we like, and we want to host them in the clouds that do those things best. So Azure applications and Oracle databases, and they didn't charge customers for any of that. That was a smart thing that helped the customer that gave them what they wanted and helped the market overall. Right? And I'm looking forward to seeing more of that collaboration where these clouds can actually work together more seamlessly without worrying so much about the transient nature of customer workloads. Like theoretically, our customers should have workloads in all the clouds, like why not? Like it, it only adds resiliency to an enterprise if they can work with multiple vendors. Right, and you know, as we were talking about earlier, each of the cloud providers has pieces of infrastructure that are not open source that may be quite good, not irreplaceable, but good. And it, it benefits all of us to be able to, you know, use Google Bigtable or Amazon DynamoDB and and not need to pay large amounts of money to send data between the cloud providers to in order to use best of you know the best of breed of each type of infrastructure. Yeah, that's a really good example. Like I love BigQuery. It's so good for data studio and other visualizations. It just makes it so easy to use. But like, am I going to get locked in there? Or like, what happens if I want my Amazon applications to use those? Am I going to be paying a boatload of money to get the data out of uh, BigQuery? Right. It's it's probably ideal for all the developers in the world if Google and Amazon compete on quality of infrastructure tooling versus just locking you in and then not having as much incentive to, to make BigQuery a, an incredible tool because your people are locked in, so they're going to use it anyway. And I think then that's going to change a little bit because if you look into the future, like there we've only experienced 
macroeconomic growth over let's say the last decade and a half like 50 like since the cloud started there's only been an upward swing in macroeconomics right um what happens when there is a cost crunch time and and there's a shrinking of multiples which we're seeing now in the market and then there is a time for everyone to tighten their belts on pnl right and so when that happens there's going to be a real look at cloud migration like does this make sense from a cost perspective maybe my old clunky data center is fully amortized and i should stay there and as these clouds want migration to continue they're going to need to and they're going to, there's a real mo repatriation movement that is occurring that has to be considered i think the clouds will reevaluate their position on some of these costs to continue to have migration ramp up we may be a couple of years from that but but i don't think growth is infinite unless there is some um, there's some rethinking on the cloud's part of cost structure and, and how expensive some of these things can be. So bringing things back to CAST, curious to learn a bit about the future. What does your roadmap look like, both in kind of the shorter term, the, the 2022, but also what's the, 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 the long-term vision? Right. So, so the vision is autonomous Kubernetes, and we've only achieved a very small kind of sliver of that. So this year, you're going to see a lot of uh, interesting enhancements come out on the reporting side and the integration with tools like Datadog and CloudWatch and basically where our customers are consuming data today and how they want to visualize data. Um, and we've got a pretty interesting reporting suite that we just released. Uh, it's kind of in, in a quiet beta right now. But beyond that, there are other areas of autonomous operations that we need to tackle. So very specifically, kind of day, what I call, uh, group them as day two operations, upgrading, patching, moving your infrastructure along so that there are no vulnerabilities. That's a whole kind of area of, of aut autonomous operation that we will focus on. This year, we will also release the second pillar of our platform, which is the cybersecurity module for Kubernetes, right? So I, 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 K8 is kind of, uh, backwards a little bit from the traditional virtual machine world in that the, those tools are fairly well understood and sophisticated. Kubernetes is not as sophisticated, uh, in my opinion. And coming from a cybersecurity background, I'm really excited to bring some of our learnings to Kubernetes. So we will, that we will release a suite of cybersecurity modules that are all intended to be autonomous and self-managing that will tie in with Seams. So Seam is a security event and information management system. There are a few big ones out there. And these what are called SOAR platforms or security orchestration platforms. Um, so that's kind of pillar number two. And that will be toward the end of 2022. And, it, and it'll probably have a three to four year roadmap. And then we're also going to be introducing data governance and high availability solution that's going to make sure that your data stays resilient and your clusters remain resilient and highly available even when clouds have issues or you might need a disaster recovery so you might be in a disaster recovery scenario so there's three you know the cost and day two operations there's cybersecurity, and then there's high availability disaster recovery those are the three pillars that we're building the platform on so super exciting future roadmap um you know i imagine you need to grow the team quite a bit to get there so tell me a bit about you know what does the team look like today and what are the plans in the future to, to keep growing yeah, so we we are uh, we start our engineering team and a lot of our uh, corporate team is in a Baltic country called Lithuania. So we, and it's it's a way for startups like if you have to build in the U.S. or Canada or in these super hotspot areas, it's very difficult to afford all the engineering talent you need. So we started building our team in the Baltics. Um, uh, and we're hiring for kind of a lot of different engineering positions, marketing positions, sales positions. But for engineering specifically, um, we're doing something really interesting for our Ukrainian, uh, for folks in the in the Ukraine. And like it's a, it's a little bit personal to me. I was born in the Ukraine. I was born in Odessa, and so everything that's going on there uh, for us and the co-founding team is is super important. But we want to give these folks a mechanism to get out of that kind of chaos. So we're offering uh, any folks that can 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 go through our loop uh, uh, that are that are currently living in the Ukraine and, and they'd like to get a, a way out. We're offering them help with their visa and their permits and their immigration status. 
and then three months of housing in Lithuania if they want to move to Lithuania, where that's closer to our, our engineering headquarters. Um, so we want to take care of all the, all the red tape and paperwork and then offer them a head start uh, to move their family. Um, we think that's a, kind of an important give back to that community. Yeah, that, that's great to hear. And, um, you know, both a, a way to help those folks and I'm sure get great technical talent to, to join the team. Yeah. It, it, not altruistic from my perspective. We're, you know, we're going <laughs> to, yeah. we're going to absolutely get the best folks uh, we can get, but we want to help them obviously as well. Yeah. Well, Leon, it's been great having you and really exciting to learn about Cast and also kind of just hear some of your perspectives on the, the overall cloud market and where things are going. Um, for folks who want to learn more, the website is cast.ai. Um, and, you know, as Leon mentioned, they're hiring. Is your, imagine you have a jobs page that's like cast.ai slash jobs or, or career yeah. or something, something like that. Yeah, if we don't have that slash jobs, like shame on us, we'll fix it. But you can just go to the home site and uh, homepage and, and you'll see the job postings. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for joining today, Leon. Thanks, man. Great questions. Really appreciate it.